God is good. All the time. That is his nature. I'm happy to be here with you this morning. My name is Sam Misiani. I'm the president of the Adventist world of the Adventist Church in Kenya, known as West Kenya Union Conference. And I want to welcome those who are in front of me, and I want to welcome our viewers in YouTube, our viewers over the Hope Channel. You are all welcome this morning to enjoy the worship of the living God. This is our worship time, and this is how we do it this morning. You are a part of us this morning. And I'm here to introduce our who is going to be other than the guest whom you have been watching over Hope Channel. His name is Dr. Willie Va and his wife, uh, Elaine, whom we shall introduce in a little time. And I want to talk to you, if you're watching over, over Hope Channel or in YouTube, the best to come. We shall have another session this evening. So for now, I want to bring to you Dr. Oliver, who is an ordained minister in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. He's a highly educated person. He holds a PhD in family sociology, a master's degree in pastoral counseling, and another, another master's degree in sociology, and a BA in theology. He's an adjunct professor at Andrews University, and is also teaching a uh, professor at uh, our university right here in Kenya, known as Afri Adventist University of Africa. Well, what I love about this couple is that they are very, very dedicated to the family. They're my friends. They have trained me in family life presentations, and it's my privilege to introduce them to you here again. Uh, Dr. Willie and his wife, Elaine, conducts marriage conferences, retreats, and relationship seminars literally around the world. I don't know any part of the world where they have not been conducting family life uh, related matters. They are founders of From This Day Forward Marriage Conferences, Journey Toward Intimacy Marriage Conferences, and they are also authors in various magazines, but of late they have produced a book, they have published a book titled Real Family Talk. They're giving answers to questions about, guess what? Answers about marriage, about love, and about sex. And I believe that many of you would love to hear more about this as has been introduced. They are also editors of the annual Family Ministries Plan Book and host marriage and family strengthening program on Hope TV and the three ABN, these are television networks within the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Willie and Elaine Oliver have been married for 33 years. Now, if I were you, I would be saying amen, whether you are in your sitting room or on YouTube, wherever you are, you ought to say amen to a people who have been married for 33 years. I've only done 30 years. But that's an evidence that marriage does work. Uh, they are parents of two young adults, Jessica and Julian, and in their spare time, they enjoy taking long walks, beach vacations. I hope they'll visit Mombasa and enjoy our lovely beaches. But they're also enjoying gardening. And, and this is for the hotels in Kisumu. Listen, they enjoy exotic cuisines and spending time with family and friends. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, join me now in welcoming Dr. Willie Oliver to speak to us this morning in Jesus' name. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Michel. Jambo Jambo. Abari Abari. Sabatum Jamma. Happy Sabbath. Happy day. It's good to be with you in Kisumu, Kenya, close to Lake Victoria. We bring greetings today all the way from Washington, D.C., and the uh, world headquarters of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. It is certainly a pleasure for Elaine and me to be here with you. We love Kenya. We've been here many, many times. 
Uh, we certainly love the people of Kenya. We, we love the food of Kenya. I'm looking for some sukuma week and some uh, ugali. <laughs> but it's always good to be with the people of God. For me, I usually say there's no better place to be than with God's people on God's day, in God's house, studying from God's word. Amen. Today is no different. In fact, Elaine and I look forward to speaking all this week, and we're going to be talking on healthy family relationships. We're encouraging you to come out. If you're not here right now, but you're hearing this program, and we're happy that those of you at home are watching, please come out. If you're in the Kisumu area, and you can get to the Victory Seventh-day Adventist Church, please do come out and have a wonderful time. We believe that when you have strong marriages, you're more likely to have strong families. When we have strong families, we're more likely to have a strong community, a strong country, a strong world. And we can begin right here in Kisumu, Kenya. Let's begin this way. Elaine and I are from the United States, and we're really from New York City, even though we live in the Washington, D.C. area. As a young pastor, I started pastoring in New York City. New York City is one of the largest, richest, most glamorous cities in the world. Despite being one of the most, one of the largest cities in the world, with millions of people, it can be one of the loneliest cities in the world. Despite being one of the richest cities in the world, it has some of the poorest people in the world, believe it or not. Despite being one of the most glamorous cities in the world, it can be one of the most disenchanting cities in the world. Today, in much the same manner, we need to compare the love that we have and the love that Jesus gives. We need to contrast the peace that we have and the peace that he gives. We need to compare the power that we have and the power that God gives. As we compare, as we contrast, my hope today is that we will look at the spiritual problems in our lives and trust God for healing, for love, and for power. Amen. My topic this morning is finding Jesus finding Jesus. Let us pray. Dear God, feed us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Luke. The book of Luke, chapter 2, verses 41 through 52. The book of Luke is the third book in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke. For those of you at home, feel free to Find your Bibles and read along with me in the book of Luke, chapter 2, verses 41 through 52. And here is what the Word of God says. His parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of a feast. Verse 43. When they had when they had finished the days, as they returned, the boy Jesus lingered behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother did not know it. Verse 44. But supposing him to have been in the company, they went a day's journey and sought him among their relatives and acquaintances. Verse 45. So when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem, seeking him. Verse 45, now so it was that after three days they found him in the temple. They found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. Verse 47, and all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and his answers. Verse 48, so when they saw him, they were amazed, and his mother said to him, son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. Verse 49. And he said to them, Why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? Verse 50. But they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them. 51. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth 
and was subject to them. Was subject to them. But his mother kept all these things in her heart. And verse 52, And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. Luke chapter 2 is a very important chapter in the Bible. In fact, this passage of Scripture, beginning with verse 41 through 52, is the only portion of Scripture where there is a snapshot, a picture of the life of Jesus since his birth until he began his ministry at the, at the age of 30. In the book of John, chapter 2, we see that before this, all we know about is him coming to the temple as a little boy. If we read the beginning of chapter 2 of Luke, we see all the announcement of the angels to the shepherds that Jesus was going to be born, this Savior of Israel. And then his parents, Joseph and Mary, they take him to the temple to be blessed, to be dedicated. What was the custom in those days and even today? To be blessed, to be dedicated. What we do know is as the couple, Joseph and Mary, come into the temple with their child Jesus, there is an old man, a mosaic, an old man who loved God and who was filled with the Spirit of God. His name was Simeon. And when he sees the couple with their child Jesus, the Spirit of God quickens in his heart and he raises his hands towards the heavens saying, now I can go to my grave. Now I can die because I've seen the salvation of Israel. Now I can go to my grave because I've seen the Lord's Christ. There's also a woman in the temple. Her name is Anna, the daughter of Phanuel. And Anna is a righteous woman. She has lived with her husband for seven years from the time she was a virgin, and then he dies. And all these years, now an old woman, she's in the temple praising God. And when she sees Joseph and Mary and their child Jesus, she too rejoices to see the salvation of Israel. Joseph and Mary were surprised at the words that were being said about their son, about their child. And then there is silence. The Bible says nothing more about Jesus until verse 42 of chapter 2 of Luke. When he turns 12 years of age. Now this is very important for you to know. According to Jewish tradition, Hebrew families, the year 12 was a transition year between boyhood and young manhood. It is at this point that a boy becomes the son of the law. At this point, the boy no longer needs to go to God through his parents, but goes directly to God. At this point, the boy, who is now a young man, it's a rite of passage, if you will. And here in Kenya, in Africa, we understand a whole lot about rites of passage. In Judaism, age 12, and that 13th year of life was a rite of passage. This is where our narrative finds us today. Here he is, getting ready to go to Jerusalem, to the temple for the feast of the Passover. You must know, brothers and sisters and friends at home, that in Jewish tradition, every Jewish man, every faithful Jewish man, went to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. But more than that, the men went to actually three feasts, the Feast of Pentecost, the Feast of Tabernacles, and the Passover, the biggest of all the festivals. The Passover was very important. The Passover was important because it reminded the children of Israel of their deliverance from bondage from Egypt, that God was a mighty God, that God was a powerful God, that God was a providing God, that God was more power than all the strengths of demons, that this God could be trusted despite the fact that Israel was in bondage in Egypt this God, this great God, had taken the children of Israel out of Egypt, out of bondage, through the Red Sea, through, through the desert, 
with manna from heaven, with water from the rock, with a, with a cloud by day to protect them from the heat of the sun, with a cloud of fire to protect them from the cold of the evening. That's why the Passover was so important. And Jesus, it's his privilege at age 12 to go to Jerusalem, not as a child, but as a young man, as someone who is being faithful to the traditions of God's word, to praise God, to honor God, to rejoice in his salvation, to rejoice in the deliverance of Israel. And here he is, excited. Have you ever had to travel someplace, perhaps to Nairobi, perhaps to Zimbabwe, perhaps to South Africa, some of you even perhaps to the UK or the United States? Every time Elaine and I are going to travel someplace, even though, as Dr. Messiani says, we have been all over the world, we're always excited. This is Elaine's first trip to Kisumu, and she was excited. Can you imagine the anticipation of going to a place you've never been? Jesus was excited. We believe that he had been to Jerusalem. Of course, we see him as a baby in Jerusalem with his parents. So this was not the first time he was going to Jerusalem, but this was the first time he was going to Jerusalem on his own as a son of the law, directly connected to God. And so they traveled to Jerusalem with their parents, with his parents, with their relatives, with their friends. And in the distance, as they came closer and closer to Jerusalem, they can see the temple, the temple of Solomon, the great temple, the beautiful temple, the center of worship of God. They were happy. They were happy to know that there all faithful Jews came to worship the God of heaven, the worship of Abraham, of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, as you say here. So he was excited. Now the Passover is seven days. And very quickly, they get to the Passover and imagine coming to the Passover. Jews from all over the then known world came together to worship God, Yahweh. They came, and as they came, just like when you go someplace and you see friends, they were excited. Mary, the mother of Jesus, sees her friend in the distance, Elizabeth. And they hug, and they do the rituals. Uh, Hannah, and Ruth, and Jacobet, and all these friends are gathering. And the men are also excited. The Mujahs are excited. So Joseph sees his friends in the distance, Joshua, and they hug, and they talk, and they're excited that God has given them one more year of life to come to Jerusalem, to feast in the Passover, to thank God, to be grateful for his deliverance. But before they know it, the days are gone by quickly. Seven days. Seven days. It's been wonderful, but now it's time to go back home. Joseph and Mary were so anxious to get back home. They were so taken up with going back to the cares in Nazareth, to cooking the ugali and the sukuma week, to uh, working in the carpenter shop, to uh, doing whatever they did, cleaning and, and, and cooking and all these things, that they left Jerusalem with their friends, with their neighbors, back home to Jerusalem and didn't realize that Jesus was not with them. When we look at the narrative in Scripture, and when we look at other corroborating literature of wisdom of those days, they tell us that Joseph and Mary perhaps had traveled for a day and were just getting to the outskirts of Jericho on their way back home when the sun began to set. As the sun begins to set, families begin to gather. The children are traveling in the middle. The women are traveling in, in the front. The men are traveling in the back. But now it's getting dark. Now it's time to go to bed. Now it's time for the families to get together. So Joseph goes looking for Mary. And Mary goes looking for Joseph. And then it happens. What happens? All of a sudden, Joseph sees Mary and he notices something strange. That Jesus is not with her that Jesus is someplace else. So a little concern 
he raises his voice and he says, Mary, where is Jesus? Now, Mary is a little startled herself and all of a sudden she realizes that Jesus is not with Joseph. And she also yells back, Joseph, where is Jesus? You know how it is in our homes. This is a week about family relationships. And one of the biggest issues in family relationships is misunderstandings. I know you have no misunderstandings in Kisumu. I know you have no misunderstandings in Kenya. I know you have no misunderstandings in Africa. Huh? It is better here. All you have to do is go talk to the pastors and it's going to be better. Joseph and Mary realize that blaming each other, blaming each other is not going to help. And so immediately, instead of fighting, instead of arguing, and most of our arguments are about silly things. Tell the truth, somebody. Most of the arguments are about silly things. And most times, it's about me being right or you being right. I don't know how it is in your home, but in my home, I'm always right. Now, that's supposed to be a joke. You know, I'm sure that in your home, you're always right. It reminds me of the guy who said, uh, Pastor, Pastor Ocho, Roki, Ocho Korodi. Ocho Korodi. Ocho Rokodi. Ocho Rokodi. Reminds me of the pastor, of the guy, Pastor Ocho Rokodi, who said, I knew I married Miss Wright. I just didn't know her, la her first name was always. I knew I married Miss Wright. I just didn't know her first name was always. Well, women can say the same thing. I know I married Mr. Wright. I just didn't know his first name was always. And it's interesting here in, 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 in Kenya that you guys give names based on when people were born. You know, I, I know some Sundays and some Saturdays or Sabbaths. And then, you know, if, if you're born in a certain time of the day, you have a name, Odiambo, if you're born in the afternoon or something like that. Yes? Yes? Okay, okay, okay. Karibu, karibu. <laughs> so what happened? Here they are and realize that there is no point in this argument. What's important is to solve the issue. What is the issue? A lost Jesus. So together, they begin to look for Jesus. They begin to look for Jesus. They look here, they look there. They look among the children and he is not there. They look among the women and he is not there. They look among the men and he's not there. They look among the donkeys and he is not there. He's nowhere. And for the first time in the life of Jesus, his parents, Joseph and Mary, the closest people to Jesus on earth, have lost him. Immediately, their minds go to a place. What place? Their minds go to the place when he was born, when Herod the king, remember him? When he wanted to find out where Messiah was. He wanted to find out where Jesus was because he wanted to send someone to kill him because he wanted to be the only king. And now their hearts are trembling. Their minds are thinking of perhaps Herod the king finally caught up with them on their way from Jerusalem. One of his spies snatched Jesus from the road. So they're heavy-hearted, and they go to bed with a heavy heart for the first time. Pastor Ayayo, for the first time with a lost Jesus. And then it happens. Early in the morning, as the sun is just coming up, Joseph and Mary, the Bible tells us, they get up and they go back to Jerusalem, the last place where they saw Jesus, because they must find Jesus. Brothers and sisters, friends, on the television, I want you to know today that our world is a crazy world. Our world is in disaster. All kinds of crazy things are happening. And even in some places where there was no craziness, now there is craziness. And we're not sure what's going to happen. But there is something we need to be sure of for our families, for our relationships. There is something we need to be sure of, and that is, if we've lost Jesus, we must find him. 
Joseph and Mary had lost Jesus and they were not satisfied to live with a lost Jesus. They get up that morning, go back to Jerusalem because in their hearts, in their desires, they must find Jesus. At the end of the, the day, as they're getting close to Jerusalem, they can see the dome of the temple shining in the sunlight and then all of a sudden, by the time they get to the temple, it's dark, it's late, and it's, they can't see anything. So for a second day, for a second day, Joseph and Mary go to sleep with a lost Jesus. But thank God. Thank God. Thank God for the third day. Thank God for another opportunity. Thank God for optimism. Thank God for faith. Thank God for determination. For if we've lost Jesus to find him, we must be determined. If we're going to find him, we need to look for him. The Bible says, you will find me when you look for me with all of your hearts. You can't look for Jesus with just a piece of your heart. You can't look for Jesus with just a tiny fraction of your heart. If you want Jesus on your side, and to have Jesus is to have life. To have Jesus is to have joy. To have Jesus is to have peace. To have Jesus is to have blessings. We must look for him until we find him. So that third day, Joseph and Mary, with new dedication, new determination, begin to look for Jesus. If you've ever been to Jerusalem, and I know some of you have been, the temple, where the temple was, it is still there. There's another temple there now. There's a different temple, though, but the walls are still there. In fact, the Jews go there to the wall, to the western wall, to pray. And often if you go out there, you see them rocking and praying. And there's a little room on the side of the western wall. And the scholars tell us, that that little room on the side of the western wall today is where Jesus was with the old men, with the muses, with the wise men, with the students of the Word of God, reading the Torah, the Pentateuch, the first five books of Moses. They're reading about God's deliverance, and there Jesus is. All of a sudden, as Mary and Joseph are looking around the temple, it happens. What happens? What happens is that Mary hears the voice of Jesus. I know that mamas could relate to this. In a sea of people, the mamas can recognize the voice of their children. Isn't it true, Sister Ocho Pro Cody? Isn't it true? You can hear the voice of your children. And Mary hears the voice of Jesus. I have a question for you today. Could you recognize the voice of Jesus? There are all kinds of voices in our world today. Social media has lots of voices. Lots of crazy voices. The media in general, crazy voices. All kinds of truths. People say, my truth. You hear people say that? Especially celebrities. Well, my truth is, and my truth is, but brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, there is only one truth. And he is the way, the truth, and the life. That is Jesus Christ. Mary hears the voice of the truth. And she goes running in that direction. All of a sudden, there she sees Jesus in the middle of all these muses. And there he is, asking intelligent questions, listening to them, talking back and forth to them. And they recognize there's something special about this voice, this boy. Ellen White, a spiritual writer of the late 19th and early 20th century, in her book, an important book, The Desire of Ages, she says that Mary looks at Jesus in that setting, and for the first time, she sees divinity flashing through humanity. He is the man God, but he is the God God. 
He is man, but he is God. Not man and God, but the man God. One person, she sees that, and she remembers the voice of the angel Gabriel. Remember Gabriel? Remember him? What did he say to Moses, to, to, to Mary? You will have a son, and you will call his name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. But all of a sudden, she forgets about that, and now she's just a regular mom, just a regular mama, and she runs up to him and she says, Jesus, Jesus, your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. And he is surprised, little surprised. And he says, searching for me? Why were you searching for me? I have always been here. I have never left the temple. When you came and brought me here, I've been here. And don't you know, if I'd be in Jerusalem, I would be in my father's house. This is a message of transition, that he's directly connected to God, directly connected to God. But don't miss the lesson. Don't miss what's going on. What is that? Joseph and Mary had lost Jesus, but Jesus had not gone anywhere. Joseph and Mary lost Jesus when they were anxious about getting back to their daily lives. Joseph and Mary lost Jesus when they were thinking about getting back to the daily grind of cooking ugali and sukuma week and working on the carpenter's desk. The same thing happens to us, even as the people of God. We say we know God. We say we love God. As Seventh-day Adventists, we believe we're the closest people to Jesus on earth. For those of you who are watching on television and are not Adventists, don't be worried. You could be one too. You could join this. And then you might feel that you're the closest people to Jesus on earth. But get this. Some of us Adventists, some of us who eat the right food and do the right thing, and we say we worship on the right day, we too have lost Jesus. Like Joseph and Mary, the closest people to Jesus on earth, we have lost him. We have lost him sometimes in the middle of church. We have lost him in the Sabbath school. We have lost him giving Bible studies. We've lost him singing in the choir. We say we're the closest people to Jesus on earth. Some of us are even vegetarians. I know there are not a whole lot of vegetarians in Kenya. That's okay. I hear you have a, a lake very close, and, and, and you, you eat swimming vegetables. That's what I hear. <laughs> swimming vegetables. I understand. Some of you, some other kinds of food as well. It's okay. It's okay. I'm not, I'm not condemning any of you. I'm not, I'm not chiding any of you. I'm simply saying some of us are eating the right foods. We eat the clean foods. We don't eat the, the other kind of foods. Well, we have studied Leviticus 11. We know all about it. We know all of that, and we have lost him. Brothers and sisters, Mary and Joseph lost Jesus. But they didn't stay on the outskirts of Jericho without Jesus. They got up. They went back to Jerusalem, the last place where they saw Jesus, and there they found Jesus. Brothers and sisters, today, if we've lost Jesus, we need to find him. Like the three Hebrew boys, the three Hebrew boys who were asked to choose between God or bowing down to the idol of Nebuchadnezzar, they chose to worship God. They were thrown into the fiery furnace, but in the fiery furnace they were with God and they were safe because they had Jesus. We must be like them and not be afraid of anyone. Not be afraid of anything. We need to go straight to Jesus. We need to know that to be with Jesus is the better choice to make. We need to know that when we have Jesus, we have peace and joy and blessings and contentment and salvation. Today, like Joseph and Mary, we need to get up and go back to that place. Now, just before I close, I want to share an illustration with you. For those of you who are scientists and those of you who are all into quantitative analysis and into causal relationships, 
I'm not going to make it too difficult. Follow me. It's very simple. It's like this. When we do, uh, when we do quantitative analysis, there's always an independent variable and a dependent one. All that means is that if one appears, the other one is likely to appear. Follow me closely. Let me make it even simpler. We will call the independent variable rain if it rains. And the dependent variable, the street, will be wet. Are you with me? Does that make sense? It's scientific logic, but you need to respond to me. Where I come from, I need my audiences to talk back to me so I know they're with me. Are you with me? Yes. I'm going to say, GP, are you with me? Yes. You know what GP means, right? God's property. God's property. When I say, GP, are you with me? I want you to say, oh, yeah. Let's try. GP, are you with me? Oh, yeah. There you go. I love that sound. GP, are you with me? We're having fun. We're going no way. I'm almost done. So here's how it goes. Here's how it goes. If it rains, the street is wet. Every single time it rains, the street is wet. Are you with me? Yes. GP, are you with me? Oh, yes. There you go. There you go. I love it. I love it. Okay, so let's do this so that you can be involved with me. The half of this auditorium is going to be if it rains, and the other half is going to be the street will be wet. Are you with me? Okay, when I say if it rains, I want all of you on this half to say if A, and then when I say the street will be wet, you're, no, I'm, I'm going to say if A, you're going to say if it rains, and I'm going to say then B, you're going to say the street will be wet. Are you with me? One more time. When I say if A, dependent, independent variable, you're going to say if it rains, and then I'm going to say then B, and you're going to say the street will be wet. Let's try. If A... You're supposed to say, if it rains. Let's try it again. If A, if it rains. then B. If it yeah, yeah. The people in the back, I want you to be a part of this as well. GP, are you with me? Oh, yeah. There you go. If A, if it rains. then B. It yes, it's scientific logic. Every single time it rains, the street is wet. Yes? yes. GP, are you with me? Every time it rains, the street is wet, unless there's something between the rain and the street. Are you with me? Because then you break the causal relationship. You break, you break, you break. Pastor Ochoro Cody. Ochoro Cody. If it rains, if it rains, and Pasta Ochorokodi's car is sitting out there, and it stops raining, and he drives off his car. There is a dry spot where the car was. It's rained. The street is supposed to be wet, but it's not wet. Why is it not wet? Because there is something between the rain and the street. New York City is one of the largest, richest, most glamorous cities in the world. Despite being one of the largest cities in the world, it has some of the loneliest people in the world. Despite being one of the richest cities in the world, it has some of the poorest people in the world. Believe me, they live on the bridges. They scavenge in garbage bins looking for refuge of food to eat in New York City. Despite being one of the most glamorous cities in the world, we got Wall Street, we got Broadway, we got the Empire State Building. It can be one of the most disenchanting cities in the world. Come back to the contrast. God is providing love. Do you have that love? If not, why not? Is there something between God's love and your soul? Some pet sin, something you're doing that you know God doesn't want you to do, that will break the causal connection. That will make you miss out on those blessings. GP, are you with me? Oh, yes. Follow me as I close. God is providing peace. 
Do you have that peace? If you don't have that peace, why don't you have that peace? Maybe you have lost Jesus. I hear that in these parts, they talk about juju and witchcraft. And people are afraid. If Jesus is with you, there is no need to be afraid. Because he is more powerful than all the demons of hell. He is more powerful than juju. He is more powerful than all the witchcraft in the world. If you are afraid, you've probably lost Jesus. Jesus is providing love and joy. Do you have that joy? If you don't have that joy, maybe there's something between God's joy and your soul. So here's where I close. I don't know most of you. Some of you have met once or twice. I remember a few names. Pastor Ayayo. Pastor Ocho Rokodi. I knew a few names. But Jesus knows your name. He knows who you are. He knows what you need. And if you've lost him, it's time to find him. Joseph and Mary lost Jesus. But they didn't stay there. They got up. They went back to Jerusalem. And there, where they last saw him, they found him. My brothers and my sisters, if you have lost Jesus, even if you're Seventh-day Adventist, even if you come to church every Sabbath, that's not what I'm asking. I'm asking, do you have Jesus in your heart? You're not afraid of juju. You're not afraid of witchcraft. You're not afraid of anything because he is your all in all. He is more powerful. Satan is mighty. God is almighty. GP, are you with me? So somebody in this crowd is acknowledging, Pastor, I think I've lost Jesus. It's like having a boyfriend or a girlfriend who's moved away to another city, to Nairobi perhaps. You haven't seen him for a long time. You haven't seen her. And all of a sudden your heart is growing cold because you're not together. Sometimes that's how it is with Jesus. We're not reading the Bible enough. We're not praying enough. And when we've lost Jesus, then we don't have his peace and his patience so that in the family we have better relationships. Are you with me? The reason I'm talking about finding Jesus is because our families are only going to be all that they need to be when we have Jesus in the family. The song says, sing it with me, with Jesus in the family, happy, happy home. But you can't have Jesus in the family if he's not with you. So someone this morning wants to say, yes, pastor, pray for me. I want to find Jesus. I want to find Jesus. I want to give you an opportunity to just stand where you are, not you in the front here because we don't want to cover the camera. In fact, don't stand at all. Just raise your hand. You want to say yes again to Jesus. You want to say, pastor, I want to find him again. Where's your hand? Anybody. I want to find. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Brothers and sisters, we've got to find him. Because when we find him, we find peace. Amen? Amen. When we find him, we find joy. Amen? Amen. When we find him, we find blessings. Amen? Amen. When we find him, we find power. When we find him, we find salvation. And today, Jesus wants you to find him because he's looking for you. While you think he's left you, he has not left you. He's right there, right where you left him. And today, and today, you can find him again. And as you find him, may you find the peace that passes understanding. May you find the patience and the kindness that you will need in your families to be all that God wants you to be. I am praying. Father God, 
Thank you for the visitation of your spirit. Thank you for those who've come. Thank you for those who are listening here in this venue and those who are listening at home. Somebody at home has not come to church in a long time. Somebody at home has not opened the Bible, has not prayed. Somebody at home is afraid, but somebody at home wants to say yes to Jesus. So if you are at home, just raise your hand where you are. We can't see you, but God can see you. Say yes again to Jesus. Because when we find Jesus, we find salvation. Bless this congregation. Bless those on television who are watching from home or wherever it is you're watching. And as we leave this place and as we leave this service, may we leave with the assurance of salvation because we have found Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. God bless you.